Great. So welcome everybody uh, to session nine, second to last session of this of this discussion, mm -hmm. titled "Designing Better Futures." I'm Tim Jackner. I'm going to be hosting this um, session. Uh, we've got as our roundtable participants uh, uh, Sally Sutherland and Tom Amesworth from University of Brighton, uh, Lukas Pavlik from University of Vienna. Uh, Angus uh, Jenkinson, Chair of the Cybernetic Society in the UK. We've got Elena Lena joining us. Um, she's Director of Teams Integrity in Toronto. Jason Hu from the Shanghai, Managing Director of the Shanghai Office of Wintop Consulting. Group. That's 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, are you? Okay. You're, that's still how you, that's still how you're, what your online presence yeah, that work I, I'm going to introduce is done in, in China, in several cities, not just Shanghai. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. And Marcos Bernardo from um, uh, Minas uh, Gerais University in Brazil. Right. So um, I've looked with interest at all of your submissions, the videos you submitted, and um, want to sort of spur some conversation based on um, some issues that have come up. So I'm going to start with, with Sally and, and Tom. Uh, their interesting video, which is um, laying out a kind of a, a what, the, what they're presenting as a provocation to to the design process. I see. I see that questioning the sort of ascendancy of, of rationality and goal orientation, etc. And I think that th that those who like to draw strong distinctions between design and other things, of, of which I am not one, usually say, "Well, design is design distinguishes it from art because design is goal oriented. Design is." applies rationality design you know um is product product oriented and, and framed by rational processes whereas art is about expression and and open-endedness um now as i said i i think the interesting things happen in the interplay region between these two but i, I just want to ask you what is your maybe intention in framing your contribution as a design process rather than an artistic process. And this is for uh, Sally and Tom, whoever, whoever wants to join in. I think um, I'll, I'll go if you want. Um, Tom, correct me. Well, you might want to jump in, feel free. Um, I guess so I'm, I'm a designer, I've, I've worked in design for a long time and my interest is in design because design is stepping out into the everyday and design doesn't necessarily have to be about solving a problem or being target driven or um, there's such a heavy emphasis on measuring and, um, and I think you really risk the quality that you can bring with design by doing that. Um, and as someone who has worked within the industry of design for quite a long time and then come I've then come back into academia and I'm now doing my PhD um, and I'm practice 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 based design research um, I'm just really frustrated by the idea that design is about rationality and actually that's or 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 that that's all it has to offer and of course you know when you are dealing with complex realities and you're you are wanting to make change we're not saying don't be rational. Uh, rationality has got to come into it. Um, but we're also saying there's more than that. And that's the mm -hmm. thing that we, we're really excited about playing with. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what, yeah, okay, go ahead. I think yeah, I, I think I'd just like to, um, I, I mean, obviously agree with that position. And I, I think for me, you know, design as a, as a discipline, as with lots of other disciplines, is a way of understanding and conceiving of the world around us. So I consider myself to be a, a designer by profession and academic, uh, kind of operating within the, the, the realms of design. And I would argue that the way that I'm kind of experiencing the world is through a framework of design where I can understand or identify 
the challenges and opportunities in the environment around me and start to conceive of ways that things could be uh, different or alternative. So rather than being necessarily goal orientated, it may actually be about how can we um, have an effect on our surroundings. Mm. So that's a, a slightly different um, uh, kind of an art design um, mm. kind of challenge. Okay, great. So I actually want to pose this next question to uh, a range of our presenters. I think Elena, Jason, and Marcus, I think what your presentations have in common in terms of what you've taken on is that you're, you're looking at um, human systems and you know, beyond the scale of what you might consider a design project be beyond the scope and scale and looking at um, cybernetic principles um, with, within that. Uh, now I think Elena kind of, uh, you, you, you describe what your presentation as a diagnosis, as a framing um, of the nature of some of the, the big seemingly intractable issues that we're facing in the political scene a diagnosis, um, stopping maybe short of a proposal for what is the treatment. Uh, Jason and Marcus kind of present a counterpole to that in presenting very, um, very structured demonstrations of approaches that they have been impl implementing among groups of hum humans, sort of team oriented groups. Um, so I, I think that I, the, the reason I want to pose this question to all of you is, is there, is there a bridge potentially? I mean, if, so for instance, the question for Elena would be, um, what might we learn from approaches um, that have been proposed by Jason, Marcus and others for how we might treat this disease, this pathology that you diagnosed? And maybe the question to Jason and Marcus is, how do you think the approaches you've described might be zoomed out to the level of a society um, where, which is a much more complex, heterogeneous um, and messy and maybe less specifically single goal focused than a, a team working on a specific um, issue. So I, I'll step back for a while and give all three of you the chance to react on that. Uh, can I, uh, yes, say Please. a few words Certainly. very quickly, uh, because I myself uh, am quite alert to the concept of design, uh, and you can see from my uh, submission that uh, I completely uh, avoid using that concept. A uh, little bit of background is uh, in back in 1980s, when I first went into U.S., uh, I wrote a paper as a summary and uh, as a reflection of what was wrong with the communist society that I escaped from. And uh, the, the paper's title is called The Non-Designability of Social Systems. Uh -huh. or, and then later it was published by Cato as a non-designability uh -huh. of living systems. Because I see a very clear distinction between you design, literally you design an artifact, and design a factory, or even assembly line uh, with the involvement uh, of society with other human beings. At that time, uh, Stuart Ampleby, who was my uh, advisor, he uh, didn't agree with me. He said, uh, okay, uh, the, our founding fathers of this country designed that very nice check and balance of power thing that enabled the US to grow uh, such a wonderful status. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, still, I, I still insist that uh, design at least this word has two meanings. Uh, meaning one is literally you really design something like in, you're in an engineering project. Then, and, and that, in, in that sense, uh, the design, uh, you can design as beautifully as, as you can. No pro I have no problem. 
But as soon as you start entering into a social system, human brain, human mind, and especially our perceptions, etc., you run into issues like uh, what we call brainwashing, the gaslighting, and uh, currently the fake news thing going on. So, so you run into a lot of things. So, you at least the promoters of designer uh, should answer this question. Then, if you are designing, who will be designed? And uh, usually, this discussion will lead to okay, we co design each other as like uh, uh, Alina is, <laughs> is smiling because that's the idea. It's actually a participatory process uh, that. Uh, so, so that is uh, what I submitted is our participatory program, uh, teaching people how to participate more effectively. And, and so that is, uh, and whatever system we end up with using this technology is purely depend on themselves. Mm. So, so that's my take for answering Okay, great, thank you. Uh, good, so J um, Alena Marcus? Uh, well, I, I could go. By the way, there are a bunch of people in the waiting room. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just going to admit them. What I wanted to do was to look at uh, the state of the United States and concentrate it on the federal government uh, through the lens of the viable system model. And I think that the biggest problem is the question of identity, which according to the viable system model needs to be coherent and consistent. Uh, and I think that part of the, well, a very central part of the problems in the states these days is that the body politic and the federal government itself have never actually integrated and reconciled the shameful past of the treatment of of slaves, of Native Americans, of exploited workers, of the environment. Uh, they've never integrated that with the good things. Uh, the, you know, a lot of the noble sentiments from uh, the founders, a lot of the accomplishments in the arts and sciences and the uh, opportunities that have been offered to everybody. So, and I think until and unless the United States does have uh, an integrated view of itself that accepts that it did some shameful things, that that isn't going to work. Um, and that the another point is that uh, the United States government and the United States as a whole has no comprehensive system for that looks at the future for the whole country. And I don't mean in a central planning sense, I mean just, you know, what should our future be? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, you know, one-off things like NASA or No Child Left Behind, but there's no coherent and consistent view of what kind of future is we're looking at for the whole country. Uh, and then system three is mostly the Congress, uh, although the Congress also does some three-star and some system four work. They're allocating resources to silos, essentially. Uh, the majority of which, besides uh, state and defense, are internally focused. And then when you get to the system two, a lot of times they're in, in contradiction with one another with respect to demands. And the system ones are continuing to operate in silos and not to be coordinated. And so the diagnosis is look at the United States and its government through the lens of the viable system model, and maybe that will help people come to some holistic frames where the entire country can be looked at as a whole, rather than as a, a bunch of competing interests and tension uh, and polarization settings. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. And then, um, uh, Lucas. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Marcus, Marcus, yeah. yeah. That uh, uh, was Lucas. <laughs> it's another one. <laughs> you, are, you are Marcus, yes. I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I totally agree with Alina, and uh, we have a similar situation here in Brazil, I think, and uh, it's no integration, 
And uh, uh, sometimes I say here that we, we, we need a rich, rich people education pro program for, for them. So for example, politicians, they think now their strategy is fire hosing. Like they, every day they say anything that calls attention. And this brings a lot of instability and other people are interested in other stuff, but they're not connected. There is no coordination. And I think this is really a um, bad situation. And well, how do I think what, uh, what I propose connect to a bigger um, picture? That's what you asked, right? Uh, well, I, I got this from Alina and Stafford Beer and probably connects the same ways that, that she thinks it connects. <laughs> because uh, I think uh, the, the way to solve the situations that we are, the problem we have right now is by integrating parallel decisions, parallel decision groups. And uh, I don't think this goes very beyond the scope of design. Uh, responding a little bit of what I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Jason. Uh, Jason. Jason. Yeah. Uh, about designing. Uh, it, it, like, probably you read Designing Freedom. And the, the first thing that Beer says is making this uh, conciliation between this paradox of designing freedom. That's a paradox. But you are not designing society. Like, you are um, design a different structure for other ways of self-organization to, to happen. Like, uh, self I believe in self-organization to deal with complex problems. I think that's what you say, that's the beauty of society. Like okay. it self-organizes, it's not designed, it, you cannot design all the details. Yeah, but Beard, Beard did wrote a book named Design for Freedom. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I just didn't mention that uh, design has two meanings. The first is the literary meaning. The second is it's actually used as a metaphor. So you, you guys, I think what you guys are talking uh, is using design as a metaphor to uh, regulate or to guide our social interactions. But in this case, uh, I would like to point out that it's something I call uh, metaphorical boundary or the limitness of effectiveness of metaphors. Uh, the, the, the point is when you extend the, the one useful metaphor into some other territory or new territory, sometimes it stops working. It, uh, one example would be the Newtonian uh, view of the universe. It works pretty well for quite some time for, for smaller ranges. But uh, at some point, you need to expand in, in, into an Einstein type of thinking. So, so that is what I say uh, when, when cyberneticians talking about the design and some of them say design as a conversation. And, and I will say, why not just call it a conversation? <laughs> I mean, cognition, communication, <coughs> consensus building, and the coordination and the co-construction, what I call five mm -hmm. Cs. I, I, I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if it's because I'm inside design. I come from design. I don't know if you come from design too, uh, because uh, when uh, we are inside design, trying to make design a conversation or something like this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, when I I'm looking for the strategies, I'm thinking about the neighborhood planning uh, uh, a group of 150 families planning their own neighborhood or something like this. So there is really design being done. Like they, they are planning things together, but in a conversational way, because uh, there will be no uh, high plan that they fit in. Like it's going to be from the parts to the whole. So that's how I'm trying to use this integrity in design to um, integrate these parallel decisions, you know? Okay. Uh, you can imagine a family planning their house, another one, and then you put this together, you have a, a street, and you put this together, and then you can, you have a neighborhood, and something like this. So I think that's why I use the word. <laughs> so I've got to have time to pose questions to the final, the other two presenters. We'll, we'll 
hopefully continue some of these themes in the audience question component. So, um, uh, Lukas Pavlik and Angus Jenkinson, I, I cluster your two presentations together uh, because you're really looking at systems, I mean, zooming out even further than those um, that Elena, Jason, and Marcus are looking at, looking at human, human societies and human systems within the greater um, Anthropocene perspective of understanding us as having a certain role of an agency and influence in other than human or, or, or hybrid systems. Uh, with the idea that humans as designers, whether or not you put the word design on it, um, uh, have effects both intentional and unintentional on the other than human agents um, in the world. Uh, and I, I think I'd, I'd like to maybe then, you know, building on the discussion we've had, sort of go out yet another step and, and say, if design, if we rephrase that as conversation, whatever we want to call this is a conversation or a negotiation, how do we integrate the agency of these other than human entities? Uh, uh, if humans really have put themselves in the role and that, you know, this is one definition of the Anthropocene is that we are the designers of the world, but our aspiration of as designers is to be inclusive and to see this as discussion. How do we integrate the agency of all of these other entities that don't currently have a voice in such discussion? So Lucas and Angus. Lucas, you want to say something? Yes. But Angus, you want to start. I'm the fun guy and I'm still okay. thinking about your witty comment. I go after you okay. because I'm really curious how you start this question. So it's a wonderful question. Thank you very much. Um, my response is, first of all, that if the COVID was brought up at the beginning, I think the current situation can be seen as an ecological challenge, an ecological situation. It's there's an ecological situation in which the human beings perceive themselves as in, under some kind of threat in their society. And I talk about social ecology and other forms of ecology. I'm skeptical about Jason's view, so I take the view that you can certainly design societies. I believe Jason has in fact designed societies and organizations very successfully. And I think there are all sorts of ways in which you can design and change societies. So what, what there is though is good design and bad design and different ways of design. So I think that human beings are all agents, that we act out of our own purposes, and so does every living organism on earth, every living thing. No creature, there's no creature on earth, and there may be more than just living creatures, but certainly as a minimum, every living thing, down to bacteria, is acting as an agency in a situation. And that situation is always bonded to all sorts of other situations as they are perceived by other living things in which their environment is. And what we're talking about is we have been designing, forming, creating in various ways an ecological environment for ourselves that simply doesn't work. And one of the consequences of that is it also doesn't work for all sorts of other organisms. So we need to get a lot smarter in understanding how we live in bonded environments, in interconnected, interdynamic environments with other living things, with ourselves, with other human beings, with other forms of life, and we have to take responsibility for trying to do something about that in a way that's helpful. And in that way, the sorts of tools that are available in cybernetics like context, situation, feedback, interventions, and others are very, very helpful. Great. So can I add to this? Because yes. I think this now leads from a second for first order cybernetic question of how it is to a second order cybernetic question of how, how, how it comes to be. You don't look for the answer outside of your doing, outside of your observing. Mm -hmm. And so in order to give other entities speech, we have to allow to give ourselves speech and a voice. It is exactly the same problem that Alena is addressing. 
and uh, how it works in society, in current society, you have to either be very entertaining and I work together for my part, which is at large about how <laughs> fungi, fungi can save, fungi can save <laughs> the, the biosphere, as like fungi, fungi and fungi can save the biosphere. And how, how do we do this? By interacting and by exactly also solving the original question. The original question is, how to design living becomings and how to use design in a manner that the living continues. And my uh, manifesto, which I uh, wrote, it has design in it. And it says, we have to design the fungi future and humanity's future as a symbiosis because fungi, I didn't know that before, is the original realm before plants came into being mm. and before animals came into being. Fungi arranged the original design, they are the architects, so to speak, the non-human mm. architects. And we need a symbiosis of interaction of the human and the non-human architects. And in our system now it has to make money and it has to be entertaining, otherwise it won't get protected or some people will take the money and not change the system. Because we always, and now I close this loop, we always get trapped in the first order cybernetics question, whatever we're doing, because we're living in the first order cybernetic world where absolute power to rule in an objective manner is like the hidden goal of everyone playing the game in humanity. Because overall, when you look at history, it's a history of empires and which empire designs the rules of the world. And you think you do this object objectively. And that's why we always design something that destroys all living until we co-design it. This is why you want to put the word conversation in until you notice that everything we sign comes out of a human conversation, which Paul Bangero very well, well puts in how he designs cybernetic conversation. I totally agree it with you that, that the organism, every organism we interact with speaks to us and we speak to yes. it in a way. And we, we've under recognized that as a fact as I, I make a differentiation not so much between first and second cybernetics because of course there's recursion and observer participation and so on, but more between the dominant ideology, the dominant paradigm that ran from about 1600 until 1943, but it's still operating in fact. And it's contrast with reality. So science created a dogma that said there's no such thing as telos and purpose and, and so on. And it created that as a dogma. Meanwhile, everybody behaved in reality as if they were. They created businesses and this and that, and they went to war and they created companies and they designed things and so on. Biologists recognized that it was that thing that you couldn't live without, but you couldn't admit. So we've had centuries of this dichotomy between a science that said it's like this and a reality that operated like that. That's the big problem. It's, we are infants in understanding what's involved in designing things today and, br and transforming our science, which is still stuck in the old paradigm for the most part, in, in multiple layers in which people get trained from babyhood into that. You start playing with Lego and you learn how it's all about fractured things and those parts get assembled into holes, for example. Not Lego's great fun, but it also teaches a certain way of seeing the world. So I, I'm to, I personally believe that, that we are facing challenges today that require us to get a lot more intelligent about how we confront them and co-create and work together. I, I, what I loved about Sally and Tom's presentation it, now it comes to me in this context, is that what you were doing is designing something in a co-creative way. So there are many ways in which design can happen. It doesn't have to be one person is in charge of it all. It can happen out of some kind of process and then something can arise. You were designing what you were asked earlier on the beginning, why, isn't, why don't you call it an artwork? Well, it could be an artwork or it could be an ecological in, intervention to try and make some sort of difference in a city or whatever. 
Okay, good. Well, we that I think that's a good um, statement on which to go into our breakout sessions. We've arrived at the time. So I, I to give a little bit of maybe focus to the breakout sessions, I, I think um, the proposition of this session, I mean, yesterday I chaired a session also having to do with design and cybernetics, um, mainly design as such, designers looking at cybernetics in design. I think this session is really in, in various ways stretching and reconforming the idea and the extent of this, be it a metaphor or a process or an approach or a paradigm of design um, and kind of begging the question, uh, is design, at what point is design as a metaphor useful? I mean, what are, are you know, does it extend um, to the societal level? Does it extend to the, you know, the, the planetary level? And I, I've heard statements sort of both affirming and questioning this. And I think maybe this might be something that the breakout groups might want to work through as they, as they discuss. Does it have to be a metaphor or could it be that they think about whether it's a metaphor or not as well? I mean, I that could be, that's another question. And I'll leave it open to what develops in the groups. Okay, so we've got seven minutes for the breakout groups. Um, and then after that, after that, we'll come back together. Please each group save questions. I mean, the, the, the um, chat from the work, the breakout group will not translate to the chat here. So coming out of the session, please maybe nominate someone from each of the groups to type in a question or two um, that I will then put to the speakers. Okay, so we're ready to allocate to the work to the breakout groups. Hello, familiar faces. Hi, Lou. <laughs> Thanks for joining. I see Adlan here too. Good to see you. Jocelyn. That was really fun. Oh, it's been, it's been a fun couple of days. Let's see. Let's, I, there's always more good questions than I can get to. In, in the, in, so I just had to take a look at what's accumulated. What is that background? My background? No, I was looking at Jocelyn's background, but it's gone. Oh. Hi, Jocelyn. Just wanted to say hi. Hi. <laughs> all right, we are all back on. I will mute now everybody except for the panelists who can unmute themselves. Thank you. All right, and uh... We cannot hear you. I'm mute, team. She's muted me as well. Okay. I'm part of I'm part of everybody, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to know. It's comforting. <laughs> um, it's how one finds out, you know? Yes. <laughs> you are designed. <laughs> A limitation of your action. You find that oh I'm part of everyone. Right. Okay, so uh, what I was saying is please someone or um, multiple people from each group start putting in the questions into the chat that have emerged from your group and I will try to ask as many as possible. So one question has been po posted so far so that's the one I'll start with. Um, from Robert Martin, um, it's a broad question. What is real and what is metaphorical in the design process? And I, uh, that's the distinction what design is, is metaphorical, and the reality of design happening is real. But the interpretation of it is the metaphorical part. Hmm. You won't be satisfied, but the whole problem of digitalization and also of Wittgenstein is that you cannot fix a meaning onto a word and mm -hmm. keep that clean and separated in any way. Mm -hmm. So the real design is what is happening as a whole. The interpretation is the metaphor. 
that is changing according to our language game, our current language game. But why is design itself metaphorical in that sense? Can you not design something that has... Um, so certainly language is full of metaphor and we live with metaphors and so on. There's no problem at all. But we've been using that for centuries. You go back to the Greeks and they learned rhetoric and for many, many centuries, this was a really core part of the education process. Yes. Okay, I'll move it on to keep it, to keep it rolling. Uh, Jocelyn Chapman asks, how can the language of cybernetics and attention to languaging help orient society toward more global consciousness with ecological sensitivity and care? Another big question. Okay, when there's no answer, then the answer is business. It needs business and the right marketing narrative. And actually what is happening in the reality of, of the world outside of schools, which is also reality happens outside of schools, that education and advertising has to become the same thing. It already is the same thing outside mm -hmm. of schools, but it has also to be designed as the same thing because the entertainment and education and survival, it's all melting. Yeah, I mean, and that is and maybe, one that's maybe one of the undercurrents in the issues that um, Alina is raising is the way that impressions are, are formed or what, what, counts, what counts as knowledge. Um, yes. The role of education and advertising and entertainment seem to get intertwined. And especially those, from my point of view, who are interested in ecology must get far better in acknowledging that there is actually a war going on, a kind of a cold war going on, and this warlike spiel theory, like game theory competition, which is almost always ending in war, either in little ones or in big ones, is the primary game. And in order to get further than we already are in ecological sensitivity. We really have to address what is going on in this war game. Otherwise, there will be no going further anymore, I think, because it's as long as we're playing this war game, but we act as if we would be living in the civil society, hmm. we cannot address the problems of the war game going on, which hinders us in order to, to change really something, mm. to really change something. Yeah. Well, my answer to that question about uh, how can the language of cybernetics and attention to language help? Uh, I think that answer is very simple. Uh, we need simply, simply just to translate the language of cybernetics into English. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Well, give you an example. Hmm. Uh, I believe that uh, those authors who wrote um, the book called the Bible, uh, as first wrote in the uh, Moses Ten Commandments, I believe that a small group uh, working very hard there to figure out that kind of the cybernetic principles that will help the survival of those people. Hmm. I think they. they they might have a very complicated models and a lot of debates, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, they were able to translate it into 10 simple sentences, uh, 10 commandments, so that everyone in a group can understand. So I think that was my answer. Yes, I think that's a good one. There are many, there's a whole book uh, full of other commandments, of course, on how to behave. But the basic, there, we have words like situation and context and signal and so on, which are not that difficult for people to, to talk about. Um, I, I think that we often get into confusions because the language of science, most of the time, I'm being one of those generalist statements, please ignore it, but there's a lot of the time 
what goes on is an argument between mid-level abstraction and mid-level abstraction. And these mid-level abstractions are kind of in invented non-realities that mm. words are given to. And then we debate about this mid-level abstraction versus the other. Whereas the world consists of actual things that are down there that are phenomenal that you can video or observe in the world. You, you, you can perceive them with our various means of observing them. And then there are top level universal concepts. There are top level principles of how things work. And there's all sorts of abstractions in the way. And what we need to do is just be clearer about that, get rid of some of the rubbish and find language that actually works that people can connect to. And my experience is that they can. Yeah, let me follow one, one point. Uh, a lot of uh, academic jungle and academic uh, gobbledygook uh, make us feel so enjoying of ourselves that we forgot that uh, if you take this to, uh, let's say, someone working on a cash register and uh, their eye oh, will rolling up. And that is a sig signal to us that uh, this is not the right language. So we need to reinvent uh, whatever we find, whatever our insight would be. We need to interpret it into common language, simple English. That's, that's my point. The rolling eye is a very powerful signal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> we need and, to, <laughs> we and need often to alert to that. <laughs> very essential to most design processes. How often do you use so, autopoiesis outside of this environment? Sorry, what was the question? How often do you use autopoiesis outside of this environment? To come back to the simplification <laughs> of language. Mm. And, um, okay. I will um, I'll proceed with a question from Lou Kaufman on the, the idea of boundaries, both joining and separating. Uh, how does this balanced view, which he sees as natural to design, how is this view broken in the political domain. So I guess a distinction between the type of processes that characterize design and those that ca characterize politics. Does he, does he mean it broken, meaning it doesn't exist, or broken as in there are not very good boundaries? Well, Lou, why don't you speak up and clarify? Maybe you can tell it better than I can. Uh, it's it, it's not the question, how does it become broken in the political domain, although that's a good question, but that, it, in fact, it often is broken in the political domain. So, for example, you could have a politician who insists on having a wall between one country and another, and his emphasis is entirely on the separation, and uh, will have no discussion about uh, the joining of those two societies, which is just as important as the separation which he promotes. So that here is an enormous opportunity for the discussion of the, of the actual situation of the boundary between two societies, which is being, which is being taken over by one side of, of that modality. If it can be opened up, that would change the whole discussion. So is, is it a question of the nature of the discussions that characterize design and, and that characterize political discourse, at least in- Well, indeed it is. The, the, discussion, uh, the discussion as held is a discussion about designing a wall, but the discussion could be the discussion of designing a relationship mm -hmm. between the two countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tim, are you addressing that to the panel in general? I, I am, yes. That, Lou, Lou is addressing that to the panel through me. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize that design is never neutral. And I think a wall is a good example of that. You know, it's a, it's a social and a cultural and a material mm -hmm. force. So however you're using design, you can't separate it from the political. Um, but I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I would enjoy, actually, I enjoy the question because I'm wondering if it isn't broken at all, 
the, how, how the, the boundaries in, in politics, but we just don't like what we see. Because what really works and what I find really fascinating as a Viennese watching American politics, that they really come up with a story every four years as if it mattered for whom you vote. They really catch you that you think, okay, now there's something is gonna change. And now it really, now it really matters. I mean, it's the, end, it's the end of the world. And as far as I'm seeing it, this kind of propaganda works now for, for many de decades. Actually, when you think of the Cuba crisis, is many decades ago, and would be even more this situation is like, oh, if the wrong person wins, it's the end of the world. So politics has very clear, very well working boundaries. It's just that the pretense of what politics should be able to do or to, to be doing, it no longer works, this pretense of, oh, this will change through politics. But politics itself for 40 years, the get, get a streak that we think, or oh, if you vote for him or for her, then now really something changing. Lou, Very I, have, uh, I have a detailed answer to your question, but uh, I think we're running time out of time here. We can, I cannot unfold it here. So I'm going to email it to you. Uh, it's a recent conversation between me and Stuart. And uh, for those who you will be understand, uh, I mean, who you will be interested in knowing what it is, uh, please just shoot me your email so I will include it in your email. All right, that's good. Remember that my question is more general than the one about boundaries. The question yes. is about polarization. Exactly. Every, po every situation involving polarization, political or otherwise, could be turned into an actual discussion of the structure of the situation and the design of the situation and become cybernetic in that sense. There is always this opportunity. It's present at every moment. And, and exactly the question is we how to take that we, we how to take that opportunity. We were discussing a case <clears throat> that happened in nineteen forty five to nineteen forty seven by George Marshall. He he was trying to make compromise between KMT and the CCP in China. He miserably failed, but the same exact idea succeeded as Marshall Plan in Europe. So our discussion was why the, the same idea can succeed in one place, but in fail context, in another. Context. And there is a metaphorical boundary there that to be discovered. Mm -hmm. I think this is a beautiful question from mm -hmm. Lou. And if I may, I just, I know there are probably many other questions, but it's a very concrete down to earth in a way, practical question and hugely important. It seems to me that, uh, you know, it, cybernetics is a science that aims to describe realities, right? It's, it's aiming to say these things actually go on. People behave like this, agencies, all sorts of things, living things behave, ecosystems behave in certain ways. So when we apply this understanding to the world today, what we find is that there's a massive discrepancy between the way the world is organized and the way the world actually functions. And mm. one of the big problems in that is that we, do, we don't have institutions to solve problems in the way the world actually works. And we do have institutions that create problems that we don't want to have in order to solve probably useful things centuries ago. I give an example, the nation state. The nation state is a structure that came about for a while. It didn't exist once upon a time. Then it was created. It was invented. It was imposed as a social order on the world. And, and it no longer solves problems that we see in the world today. So it's an institution that will die. There's no question about it. It's just a question of how much pain it will happen before that happens. It doesn't solve the, uh, this, the following sort of problem. Brazil has got a massive problem of the forest being cut down. Okay, so over here in Britain or Germany or America, we complain about the fact that the jungle is being cut down. And we say to the Brazilians, don't do it. But are we paying for it not to be cut down? Are we saying this is a world resource, therefore we have to pay for it? No, why not? Because it's a part of Brazil. Brazil's the one who runs that and they've got to sort it out. But actually, 
we don't have the institutions for solving that kind of problem. That's why I think that we've got to absolutely understand boundaries very well in the way Lou was talking about it yesterday with colleagues. And we have to rethink, massively rethink the way the world works in order to make it function effectively. Sorry to be on a little bit of a rant there. No. Well, uh, the well, sorry, let me, I have to give a reminder that the next session is starting now. We usually have allowance to continue for about 15 minutes or so, which I'm happy to do. But for those of you who want to be in the next section, I don't want to be responsible for you not being there. So thank you to those of you who will shift to the next session. Uh, for those of you who will stay, let's, let's just continue the, the conversation. And I just relate to Angus. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say that it is very interesting phenomena at the moment that uh, whilst we started realizing that uh, we face global problems and not, uh, not state-related problems and uh, the state started uniting into organizations like UN, uh, European Union, and they started to uh, collaborate on solving, uh, solving those uh, issues or dealing with those issues together. At this moment, when, uh, when we are getting to the crisis, uh, we, are, uh, we are getting more and more fragmented. So the ten global tendency is to get more and more hysterical and more and more fragmented. So, uh, so there is some emergence, which is like so hysterical reaction towards like uh, non-conscious mind uh, uh, actually with uh, suicidal tendencies, if I may, may think of that this way. Mm. Or that's, that's my feeling at the moment, uh, seeing global politics. Okay, let me, let me move on. Thanks from Marie. Um, we've got a question from Michael Andrews, uh, who is proposing that it, indeed we tinker with design of society all the time. He raises the, the example of privatization under Reagan and Thatcher. One could give any number of examples and asks, how can it be done better with cybernetics? So the idea that we design society is maybe not a new one or the, this is not a new practice, how do we sell people the idea that cybernetics will do it better? Cybernetics designs outcomes and you design the outcome without unintended consequences. And there's a rigorous process for doing that. Hmm. And then you have to adapt when the world changes, of course, uh, from time to time. I might want some unintended consequences though. So, um, if I'm a designer, then I might want to produce some things that are not limited to what I can imagine, right? Because otherwise I've, especially if you ramp it up to society level, um, I wouldn't want that to be constrained within um, my intention. So I think there's maybe a, that's possibly on the kind of level of, um, level of design over a kind of framework for designing further. I think Paul talks about um, designing, designing uh, second order design or designing for conversation or designing for design, um, uh, which maybe resolves that. But yeah, I don't know if in, I don't know if avoiding unintended consequences works in every context. I'd love to ask Tim and Sally a question about that. Is that all right? Tom and Sally? So your, the question, in relation to what Ben was just saying, you went into a process and obviously you didn't know what the outcome was going to be exactly at the end, right? But as you were working through the process step by step, were you able at any point to do something with no imagination of what you were doing? I mean, that, that there was, you were doing something utterly blind or you may not have known everything, but everything that you were doing, was it in, was you, were you in some kind of, <clears throat> what was going on? Tell us. I guess um, we, uh, the whole, part of the point was that we were letting go. So part of the point that was that we were within, within uncertainty and, um, and it was playful and it was enjoyable. And I think there's something that you can get from 
kind of designing a site for experimentation, which is what we, where some of the design came in. And then it was a collaboration and it was a, a collaboration within space, within time, with, with materials, with light, uh, with the camera, uh, with, with different people. So I don't think that necessarily answers your question, but that's what we were doing. <laughs> It, it, yeah, there was, and also I think added to that, there was a process of editing and reflection. So yeah. there were, was a constant sort of process of, of feedback loops where we were open-endedly experimenting, not knowing what was going to happen, but we were also being very kind of mindful of the outcomes of those experiments and becoming increasingly selective about the, the things that we wanted to then repeat and do more of um, and how we then had conversations about it, but each time we reflect on that work, there's a, the conversation evolves again. So there is no sense of conclusion to the work because you know, we might leave it for a, a few weeks and then come back either to the original material or to the edited material and think very differently about the nature of the work that we're producing. So it is, um, yeah, it's very much kind of an open-ended process, but we did, like Sally said, you know, we did identify the elements that we wanted to be um, collaborating with. So light, the materials, the, the, you know, the time that we had, the, the soundscape. So, yeah, it wasn't designing outcomes, but it was uh, inviting in certain elements. Right? Yeah, I think it's important to recognise that we were using design as in the verb rather than designing something. So that's not my understanding of design necessarily. It's not my interest. Design is a verb, it's an action. It's a, it is a conversation, like as Paul says, as, um, um, yeah. But just remember that when I watched your presentation, I was thinking and maybe making some parallels with, with the work I did, because you are looking for a space for post-rationality, but yeah, well, you don't design post-rationality because that would not make sense, but you are thinking rationally about it. So you design a process in a rational way mm -hmm. for a uh, Latin space for, um, for sensing, for openness or for other things. And well, I, I think that's a paradox that it's possible. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, I understand what you mean. We're, we're almost being rational about being post-rational. Uh, I think there are certain things there that we don't, um, that we were interested in, like our embodied um, understandings of what it was that we were doing, which you don't, uh, you know, the practice side of it, the fact that we're making, um, those, those elements are not taken as seriously as we would we think that they could be. Um, and play and, um, and and they're things that we can really ex talk that they're things but they're things that we've spoken about since and that we reflect upon so I'd say um, maybe they're things that have come out of it okay I'm, I'm jumping around the questions there's so many accumulated I'm sorry if I don't get to your question but I'm trying to uh, find different angles on this. And I've got, uh, there's a question from Goran Atik here, which frames design maybe in a, a different way than has been proposed. Um, I mean, he makes the, pro the, the proposition that design is a process of figuring out what people want and one of acknowledging intentions uh, and asks whether designed by that is effectively limited by what people experience in their daily lives. So there are a number of aspects in there that I think could evoke responses from the speakers, but I'm interested to hear what you say. Can you repeat it? Sorry. I'll read it, I'll read it verbatim. Is, yeah, okay. is design as a process of figuring out what people want primarily one of acknowledging intentions, effectively limited by what people experience in their daily lives. Uh, then in bra the example in brackets, i.e. I'm willing to be altruistic when I have enough. Well, I think that there is something there that's uh, projecting desires on the other people and 
I think the only way to work with those desires is to leave some open space for them to happen. So you are designing something. What I'm designing is, uh, I think we should be fair to say, I designed this. Like this is a restriction. I'm, I'm posting a restriction uh, with this design for uh, restricting those possibilities and letting open a uh, space for self-organization and uh, subjectivities and everything that can happen in this scope or something like this. I think uh, this way you, you can open space for desires or something like this. If I'm designing a process for a client comes, somebody says, I've got a problem, massive problem, I want to find a solution to it. And you start and ask the question, well, okay, what, what, don't tell me about your problem because that's not very helpful, but tell me what you want. What's the outcome you want to achieve? That takes, can take a very long time. And actually there are all kinds of creative ways that you might be able to help that. So I certainly agree with the question that that's a really important part of design. It's the beginning of design until you know what you're trying to achieve you can't actually bring about something that will achieve it. So the other half also is required. And I'm afraid we're gonna to have to abruptly end there because I'm getting poked to bring things to a conclusion. This could go on for a long time and I hope it, I hope it will. These are intended to begin to start discussions. I would certainly be very happy you know, to continue this um, with any one of you or groups of you, but thank you. I'm releasing <laughs> the group for now. I um, thank you all for participating, both presenters Thanks, and, and other participants, and hope to see you in the next session that I will be shifting over to now. Thanks, co-panelists. Thank you, thank you very much.